there and welcome to Teeming with Possibility, episode two. My name is Simon Dowling and this is the podcast where we explore all things to do with what does it take to harness the collective genius of your team? How do we discover the magic that exists between that wonderful group of people that we call a team? And in today's episode, we are going to explore the theme of courage. How courageous is your team? That's a great question to start with. Or maybe here's another version of it. How courageous do you feel in the context of your team? Now, of course, that question could lead you to think a couple of things. It could think you could be thinking about the work that we do, the products that we create, the solutions that we put out there, the things we do in our organization, in our community, and how courageous are those things compared with what others might do. But I want to focus your attention on a slightly different perspective on this, and that is how courageous are the people within your team when they come together? Because let's face it, the whole thing about teaming is a risky business at an interpersonal level, at a social person uh, level, at a psychological level. When you bring a group of people together, it can have one of two effects. It can have a shrink effect or a shine effect. In other words, by coming together with this group of people, do I feel like I shrink personally? In other words, I become a smaller version of myself. I second guess myself. I self-censor. I become less even confident in my own abilities simply by virtue of the others in the room. Do I feel intimidated? Do I feel like I'm quieter, meeker, more reserved? Or do I shine? In other words, in the company of this group of people, do I feel stronger? Do I feel like I'm able to really express a perspective? Do I feel like I can fully contribute? And in fact, do I feel even more competent because of this group? Shrink versus shine. I think it's a really interesting question to think about in the context of any team because what we want, clearly, if your focus, as it should be, is on tapping the collective possibility in this team, the collective genius, then I need to be thinking about how do we make sure everyone is truly shining. So how do we get to a place where we feel not just courage at an individual level, but what you might call collective courage? And this is very much why the, the whole topic and theme of psychological safety is so important in teams. That's perhaps a term that you've heard plenty of before. Uh, it was first coined psychological safety by Amy Edmondson, who's a professor at Harvard University. I think she coined it back in 1999. But it came to prominence not just through Amy Edmondson's work in her own right, which is truly fabulous stuff, but through the research work of Google. And Google uh, ran a whole project internally in their organization called Project Aristotle. The point of which was to really unpack the science of teams. Why is it that some teams here at Google really do hum? In other words, they get great results, but they also have a great energy about them. There is a sense of belonging within that team, but there's also a sense of contribution. And as a result, they're able to innovate. They're able to come up with new ways of doing things. They're able to push through the status quo. Why is it that some teams are able to do that more than others? And through an extensive research project, which took years, thousands of hours and millions of dollars, Google identified that there were five key factors at play. And those five factors, those five dynamics, if you like, were predictors of team performance. But of those five, there was one that really rose to the top. And it was this idea of psychological safety. How safe does it feel in this team for me to voice up without being fearful of the repercussions of doing so? without being fearful that people will judge me, that people that there'll be kind of repercussions personally in some way, that it will be a career limiting thing to do. How easy, how safe, how encouraged do I feel to do that? And this one factor, psychological safety, rose right to the top. Now clearly, psych safety, as we've come to affectionately call it, is gonna be critical if what we want in our team is courage, if what we want is boldness, if what we want is people playing fully in the game. 
And so in this video, what I want to do is have you thinking about how strong that courage is in your team, but then offer you three or four really simple and powerful ways that you can get this courage piece kickstarted in your team. So let's get into it. The first of those is to spotlight the challenge associated with teaming. In other words, to spotlight, perhaps even to normalize the risks. And the way I love to do this with teams is, and I did this only last week when I was working with a leadership team, was to, to ask them first up, what it is, what is it that we want to be able to achieve as a team? What are we shooting for? What's, what's success look like for us? That's a much easier question, hopefully, for teams to answer. But then once you've done that, is to ask the question, in order to be able to achieve that, what risks do we need to be able to take? What risks do we need to be able to take? And I find some teams will answer that first up by talking about the substantive risks. So we need to be able to you know, invest some money without being certain that there'll be a return. We need to be able to challenge our customers. We need to be able to push through and wean our customers off some of the old ways of doing things to push them out of their comfort zone. So there's substantive business or execution risks. But then what I'll always do is bring them back to the core question that I'm leading them towards, which is what are the interpersonal risks within this group? What are the risks we need to take with each other in order to be able to get to those kinds of outcomes. And typically that conversation will lead to things like, well, we need to be able to challenge each other. We need to be able to, um, to push back on default thinking. We need to be able to challenge some of our assumptions. And then that sort of conversation will lead to the real crux of what you wanna normalize in a team. Now, this is a lot easier to do. It's in fact, I'd say more than easier to do, it's almost essential starting point is for the leader in the room, or maybe I should say the senior leader, to kind of go first in this piece, to demonstrate a vulnerability and to be able to essentially send a message back to the team that the interpersonal risk, this whole idea of interpersonal risk is not limited to those who are younger, less confident, less established, who have less authority, who are paid less, who have been around less time. It's a feeling that should be attached to everybody in this group. So this group that I was working with last week, the senior leader in the room, I, I had a conversation in advance just to coach them. Look, you know, it's really important for you to lead the way on this. And he shared, look, for me, I feel like the risk is, is that by working with this and bringing together this diverse group of people, that what I actually end up doing is I end up stifling conversation or I end up cutting off conversation or I end up um, through my, my desire to energize the group and to encourage us to do great things, I end up setting an environment where it feels like, well, I know what's best. And that to me is a real risk of bringing my natural energy as a leader to these conversations is that I end up killing the party. I want it so bad that I end up spoiling it in the process. So that's something I'm really worried about and I think it's a risk that I take, but here's the other flip side of that. And this is what he was talking about, so I'm kind of paraphrasing. He then said, I also really want to be able to create an environment where people can step in and take ownership. I want them to be able to challenge the status quo. I want you to be able to do that. But I fear that when I therefore pull back out of a conversation or I say less, that I will lose control. And so to me, that's a, an interpersonal risk is that you'll either take, take things and run too far with it or that I'll lose my voice in this conversation. So that was a very personal kind of share, if you like, from this leader around the risks that I feel I need to take in this room with this group of people. But then that underpinned and enabled a really rich conversation across the group of the sorts of risks that we all feel and therefore we need to take. So some people saying, well, as someone who is new to this industry, I feel like, well, the risk I've got to take is by bringing in my perspectives, but without always knowing whether they're actually going to be relevant or not. And therefore, will you think that I'm you know, harping on old experiences or that my past experiences are all I've got. 
and others saying, well, as someone who's newer to this organization, my risk is that I'm too cautious and too careful to wait until I fully understand something and therefore I don't contribute. And then someone else saying, well, look, I'm always sensitive about the fact that I have lots of opinions, but I don't want to, I don't want to dominate conversation. So therefore I tend to bite my lip quite a lot. I mean, what great conversations for every team to be having, because what it's doing is normalizing the fact that we all feel these risks with one another and there is no clean and simple answer to it. But identifying them brings it to the surface and makes it now a shared problem. This reminds me a little bit, actually, of um, many years ago, I, I was part of a leadership development program. And one of the things that was built into this program was uh, we took all the participants off onto a high ropes course as, a, as an activity to take them out of their comfort zone and reflect on what that means for their leadership. And so high ropes course, if you haven't done one before, you kind of arrive at the location and there's all these you know rope structures high up in the trees. And so as you pull up in the bus, which is what we did, you could look across the group and you could see some people's eyes would light up with excitement, like, cool, we're going to be able to do something. You know, these are the adrenaline junkies. We're going to be able to do something that's fun, different, challenging. Others, you could see them just go white and very quiet and very ashen-faced and very reserved because A, they're scared of heights, but B, perhaps also thinking a little bit of like, oh my gosh, in this group of people, the last thing I really wanted to do is to be caught out being scared to be seen out of my comfort zone, to be seen, uh, you know, how will I be judged? Will I be considered a coward? Will I be considered a chicken? Like, what's the implications of that? And so there's this nervousness as the group all gets off the bus and this real lopsidedness in the group. And the gentleman who would run this activity, his name was Peter, would essentially bring the group around and ask people to reflect on how they're feeling as they stand around and you know he'd cover the full spectrum who's feeling excited enthusiastic can't wait to get up there and you'd get a bunch of hands who's feeling like you know what i'll be really interested to see how this plays out and then you go the other end of the spectrum who's who's thinking to themselves i can't wait to get out of here and he'd get this full spectrum and what he would do is put his own hand up at this point and say, I personally always feel nervous here because I feel like I have a healthy respect for heights, but I also feel like I don't yet know how this activity is going to go with this particular group of people. And so as much as I might be comfortable about racing straight up a ladder and getting up into the trees, I'm conscious that this is not about me having fun. This is about this group collectively learning something. So then the invitation was, he'd ask the group, how do we kind of create a more level playing field here? How do we normalize things? And that would lead to people thinking about, well, maybe I have to challenge my assumption about the goal being here to be the perfect rope climber in this session, but instead to just take one or two steps beyond my comfort zone. It led others in the group to say, how can you become a great coach, a supporter, an enabler of people rather than a show off? Uh, or just here for yourself to have fun. If you've got this mindset of like, it's the winners and the losers in this, how do we challenge that so that we maintain, or sorry, rather manage our competitive streak? So a great conversation that led to always a much more powerful experience. And I think it's exactly the same in teams. We're all standing there looking up at the ropes course and thinking, how do we get to a place where we are collectively courageous? And rather than just relying on three or four people to do all of the courageous stuff. So that's the first idea, is to talk about it, what you might call spotlight, the risks, in order to normalize them and make them a shared problem. That then allows you to do the second thing. And that second thing is build some shared or simple agreements, even just understandings between each other that respond to those. So it allows us, if you like, to create a social contract between each other. For the leader to say, I want you to know that one of the things I will do is over talk in certain situations because I'm scared of leaving awkward silence in the room. So here's what I need from everybody else. I need you to put your hand up <laughs> so that I know you've got something to say. Or I need you to write something down and hold up that post-it note. Or I need you simply to say to me, could we take five minutes to hear from everyone? So it's giving permission, but it's building agreement in the room as well. 
or you might have the group talk about, you know, let's make sure that in any key decision we make that we do build in time for everybody to jot down their thoughts before we start the conversation because there's some more quiet reflectors in the room, people who need to process their thinking before they're prepared to express a view in public. Uh, or perhaps it's that we will frame the questions that we want to ha discuss and debate in a, in a meeting, for example, we'll frame them before and give people a chance to prepare. These sorts of simple things, which might be simply a case of saying, how do we build some agreements between us or some understandings that say, let's you know let's help build that courage another one actually i love just thinking about that is um whenever we're having conversations for the leader of a conversation so not just the leader of the team but the leader of a conversation to be explicit about what they would love from the different people in the room so from you simon i'd really love your perspective as someone who's newer to this organization from you tracy i'd love to hear from you as somebody who traditionally has not you, you know, not being a great supporter of this way of working. So everyone's kind of given a role in that conversation, which leads me to the next piece, the third idea, if you like. So we've talked about spotlighting and normalizing the risks, and then from there building some basic agreements and understandings off the back of that. But then the third thing is probably to create an environment where all voices in conversation is the expectation not just an invitation. And what I mean by that distinction is often we do invite other people's voices. Like we'll say, if anyone has a different view on this, please feel free to say so. Or does anyone have any thoughts or questions? So we kind of throw out there this vague and slightly flabby invitation to people to participate. But the process doesn't necessarily bear out for them. It may not feel like there's enough safety or people may not have enough courage in that moment to speak up. So what if we changed it to say it's not the invitation, it's actually an expectation. So if all voices is an expectation, then that has to be hardwired into our process. In other words, whenever we're making a key decision, we will allocate five or 10 minutes to hear from everyone or whoever's leading a conversation will do a room sweep. In other words, let's go around the room and hear from each person. Or we'll build in some nifty little processes as a team to say whenever anyone expresses a point of view and we're in a debate that person also then has to pass to somebody else in the room to say i'd be curious to know what you think of this tracy or you think of this simon make that pass and then that person has to pass to someone else i talk about that as the rule of three passes or you can change the number you've got to pass different people pass three times or four times before the conversation ends so this kind of um, uh, you know, foundational style of working as a group now makes contribution, discussion, and expectation go one step further. It might not just be all voices. It might be dissent and debate is an expectation, not just an invitation. So do we as a team have a process that says whenever we're making important decisions, we allocate time, whether it's 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever, to actually canvas some divergent points of view or different perspectives or downright disagreement with our point of view. So there's one group I worked with not long ago, we, what, we, what we tried and they've been doing it ever since, it worked really well, was when they were making key decisions, they then say, okay, who are the voices or the different perspectives we want to bring into this discussion and let's break up into some smaller groups and actually flesh that out. So, you know, this small group of two or three people is gonna be the voice of the um, the customer who doesn't like what we're proposing. This group's going to be the voice of the internal stakeholder who's going to disagree with us. This voice is this group is the voice of um, uh, the voice of uh, how a different industry would see this. So then, what we do is canvas very systematically two or three different points of view, and then step back and go, how does what we've just canvassed now? How does that change the decision? How does that change the way we're thinking about this? Do we come out stronger and better for the ability to do that? And you can see how building this into the process, it's like setting a quota, right? Creates courage or enables courage because now it's not a question of, oh, am I seeking permission here? It's actually you've been given more than permission an expectation's been set. So that's the third idea, which is make this 
different sets of perspectives and voices and expectation, not just an invitation. Which, if I were to go to one final point on this, it's number four in my mind, is how do we in our team create a situation where as a, as a, as a group, we share a strength, we share a skill in learning questions and discovery questions. Because one of the dynamics I see a lot, which I think very quickly can erode the psychological safety in a room which in turn completely washes away courage is that people play you know they shoot each other down with their questions perhaps inadvertently but someone puts an idea out and someone else says that'll never work that'll never work well it's not a question at all so they're shooting down with their reaction so that'll never work here's how i've done it have you tried this Uh, have you spoken to so and so why aren't you doing it this way these sorts of questions which the intent might be to get to the best outcome, but it can feel very much like a quick attack. And so the individual who's going, well, I've put myself out there and shared an idea, and now I am being you know, peppered from all sides with people's opinions and criticisms. Why would they stick their neck out again next time? So if instead, and again, as a team, we need to hold the space for this, we said, so whenever someone presents an idea, can we first of all have five minutes of genuine inquiry, where our questions are to learn more about the decision, learn more about that person's thinking, or even just learn more about them. So the questions might be, can you talk me through a little bit how you came up with this particular line of thinking? I'd love to better understand the data that underpins that, the research that you did. Or there might be more open questions, which is what did you enjoy most about pulling this together? What was what was the thing that stood out most for you? What did you learn? What, what are the learnings from this that you think are most useful for us as a team? And this ties very closely with, again, if I can come back to Amy Edmondson, who described psychological safety as being an underpinning for an organization that shifts away from an execution focus, which is where the team dynamics are all about, you know, let's just execute, let's just focus on what the output is. A shift from that to a learning focus, which is where the intent and the energy becomes first, how do we learn, listen to and learn from one another? Because now that honors the unique contribution that each of us can bring to this table. And it creates not just space for it, but attaches value to it. And by attaching value to your contribution, over time, courage is built. So there's our four ideas. And I think that idea of over time, courage is built is an important one. Because all of this is not about, you talk about this once as a team, And there you have courage. You can't, like I've seen some teams do this, right? They'll stick posters up on the wall or get coffee mugs printed saying, let's be bold. And it's like a catch cry, a rallying cry. But let's understand that to truly develop that courage, we've got to slowly manage people's perceptions, their fears, the ingrained concerns they might have that are inherited from past teams, past organizations, their childhood that go, it does not pay to speak out. How do we shift that over time? And the way to do it is to think of it, it's like you know, rock climbing, where you do not get from the bottom to the top in a single jump. You slowly make your way up by establishing, identifying and securing footholds and taking that, that cliff face, that rock face, one foothold at a time. And sometimes you miss, sometimes you slip and you drop back down and you just pick up again and you keep going. So as a team, you're establishing through all of these little conversations, these little behaviors, these little practices, you're establishing these footholds that allow you to slowly climb that rock, that cliff face over time. So let's um, quickly summarize. What did we talk about here? We talked about the importance of courage and how it's underpinned by that sense of safety. But if courage is what we want, let's talk about that first. So first of all, spotlight the challenge. So what do we want to be able to achieve as a team and what are the risks that's going to require us to take? From that conversation, making sure the leader always goes first and establishes vulnerability if possible, but building on that saying let's make some basic agreements or establish some shared understandings between us on how we want to be able to work. We won't always get it right, but let's establish those as those footholds. Then the third one 
is to make the idea of all voices in conversation, not just an invitation, an open invitation, come if you want, but actually an expectation. We build it in to, and hardwire it into our process. And then the fourth and final one was really obsess about, focus in on our shared capability and discipline around using great learning and discovery questions, inquiry as our first port of call when people put an idea on the table so that we demonstrate first a willingness and a value attached to listening and learning from each other rather than simply just jumping to what's the outcome here and treating each other as roadkill in the process. I hope that's useful. There's four things to play with. And I think that's the nature of these podcast episodes. Each one will be a bit different, but I want to explore and share some of the challenges that I most commonly am coming up against in the teams that I get to work with. That's part of the the great privilege of the work I do as a leadership team coach. So I get to work with a huge variety of teams and leaders and dynamics, individuals and relationships. It's a complex web. So what are some of the factors that I keep coming back to in that work, the ones that I've encountered, the ones that I'm struggling with today? And on that note, I'd love to hear from you. What are the things, the questions, the challenges you'd love to, you'd love me to explore in some of these episodes? In future episodes, I'm also going to set up some conversations with people who are at the front line of leading teams or being part of high performing teams or perhaps the opposite teams that are struggling and what have they learned from that? So to really generate um, as much insight and understanding and hopefully inspiration for you and me when it comes to building teams that hum. That is it for today's episode. Um, Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.